so that it's Sarah and I. Hey, we're in this series. Uh, if you have missed any, I sent a link out this week uh, so you can go to the, the playlist of all the series. And last Sunday, I think, is one of our most played messages um, this year. And so if you missed it or if you were here, maybe you went back and watched it, but uh, it jumped up real quick. So hopefully this series for the summer has been enjoyable for you. We're just progressing through the life of David before he becomes king in, in Israel. And, and so last week he killed the giant Goliath and he stepped out of the shadows to become well known amongst the people. Now his name is kind of famous. And after the battle, he goes back, he speaks to Saul, the king, and he meets Saul's son, Jonathan, and they instantly become best friends. If you have a Bible, you can go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. We're going to go through chapter 18, 19, and 20 this morning. <clears throat> Here's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 2 and 4. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. David gets reinvited back to the palace to serve Saul, and his life has now changed forever. He's gone from young shepherd boy to a commander of warriors in the king's army. And then in verse 5, we're told that whatever Saul asked David to do, he did it successfully. Now, I have a bad habit, or maybe not so much of a, a habit, but a personal problem, uh, and I had it a lot worse before Jesus met me, and or I met Jesus, he always knew me, but, but that problem is I like to win. Does anyone in here like to win? Um, maybe, does anyone in here like to win at an unhealthy, like you recognize your feeling toward needing to win is maybe not super healthy. Uh, I love to win. We told you last week, right, winners are, are winners, like when my God will do this. And, and so I just like to win things, not that anybody probably likes to lose, but I really hate to lose, and I don't even hate to lose as much as I really love to win, and I like to win because it makes you know that you're better than the people you're competing against, <laughs> right? Like, it, it, you have tangible proof. I am better than you at this thing, and, and so, right, I also like to win because uh, people want to be winners. You want to feel that feeling when you win, that high that you get. And when you win, when you find success, uh, it also makes people envy you. Anyone here like to make some people jealous when you win at things? And this drive in me was so bad growing up as a kid, I would cheat at Monopoly against my siblings. Now, let me just show a hands today. Who here has cheated at Monopoly before? All right. Yeah, plenty of us in the house today. Uh, now, when it comes to Monopoly, my brain works kind of like Rain Man on, on a Monopoly board. Like, I see the dice. I know exactly where the piece is going to end. And so I would double tap spaces. You know, I'm just counting super quick. I know where I'm going to end, and I know where I'm not going to end if I don't want to land where I want to land, and, and usually you're playing with kids, and so it's too quick, right? And they're, they're like, is that where you're supposed to be? Yeah, yeah, I counted. You heard the taps. <clears throat> That's not healthy. It's not necessary, and I don't cheat uh, anymore against my children uh, at, at board games too much. And so, so I want you to, to think about it. Who do you despise or have you despised in the past because they beat you at something? Or they outdid you at something. And maybe this isn't a game. Maybe this is life. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's some other thing. Maybe it's at the red light when you're stopped next to somebody and you're like, well, this person's not getting ahead of me as these lanes merge. I have to win, right? Or maybe you got passed over for a promotion that you thought you deserved. Or maybe that one person on social media who looks like they have it all together and you're like, I can barely get out of the house every day. Or maybe you have a frenemy and their kid always has nicer stuff. We had a student back when I was a youth pastor in Sacramento. We played ping pong. We had like air hockey, ping pong, and different stuff. And every single week, Pastor Sean, let's play ping pong. And so we'd play ping pong. And year after year, because of this unhealthy drive to win, I would not let this student beat me at ping pong. And there were a couple close calls, but, but I would come back from behind. And then we'd talk trash because that's what you do to build relationship with young people. They like it. 
And so for years, for three full years, actually, as I was his youth pastor before he graduated high school, uh, he never won a single match. And finally, he graduates high school. He's still at the church. He beat me one time and then never would play me again. He said, nope, I... Three years don't matter, I'm going out on a win, and he never played ping pong with me, and I never saw him again uh, after that. Actually, like, we we moved on, and I haven't seen him, and and so for all the rest of eternity, he will go out on a winning streak at ping pong, and and so that's, like, how unhealthy this need for winning was, Um, and you probably like to win also, but sometimes we don't even realize that we're competing with other people until something ugly comes out. You know what I'm talking about? Like something, you just say something or you feel something, you're like, oh, I don't know where that came from. And so today as we look at Saul and David and Jonathan, I want you to just be on alert for some relationships that God might bring to your mind, right? If it, if it thought pops into your head as, as we're going through the morning today, or some of these dynamics are maybe being played, played out or, or have caused you issues in the past. I just want you to, to let them be on the radar today. Let, let yourself be aware of what those relationships might be as God is, is hopefully bringing them up today. Because Saul starts getting jealous of David. He and David go out to war together. And when they return, verse 7 says, this was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Now, this enrages Saul, and and he starts to become jealous of David. What kind of person are you when you hear about somebody else's success? Do you get jealous that someone else is being recognized? Do you feel angry that that maybe your accomplishments aren't being recognized at the same level? Or a lot of people struggle to, to genuinely celebrate other people's Wins And somewhere along the way, we start to believe the lie that if someone else is recognized and they're successful, it must mean that I'm less. I bet, which I don't, but if I were to bet, right, uh, I would bet you probably have more people you could go to for hard times, for frustrations, for pain, for, hey, I'm hurting, I'm struggling, will you pray for me? I bet you have more people you can go to for that than you can go to to celebrate your wins in life. Say, hey, I just got this promotion. Let's, let's get together and celebrate. Hey, can I call you? I just want to tell you about this awesome thing that happened today. Most of us have more people we can go to for hard things than, than we can with victories. And Saul couldn't hear that the song started by recognizing his accomplishments. He only heard that David was also being recognized and that the numbers were higher on David's name. There were more accolades being attributed to David. And so Saul repeats his mistake from the past and he sends David away again. Saul's closest ally and supporter was David. And David was responsible for bringing great success to Saul's kingdom. And Saul threw it away because he was an insecure and jealous person. And and so he heard some things going on in David's life and he gets upset about it, right? And, And you just get stirred emotionally a little bit. And, and so, so Saul is frustrated. He's angry. He sends David away. He, he intended to send David away to, to kind of go out, give him a tiny group of soldiers. So David, take your little merry band of, of guys and go out and I'm going to give you some stuff to do. And David took that group and he continued to be successful and his name started to grow even greater in fame. And, and so Saul thought he could send David into obscurity, but all that did was put David on display for how amazing God was working in David's life for everyone to see. See, the, no one can send you into obscurity if you serve the Lord. He will make you famous when your time to be known is ready. And, and so before, Saul was close to David, and, and when they fought together, David's victories looked like Saul's victories. And, and so Saul sends him away, and now they're separated, and David's victories are now David's victories, and Saul grew jealous toward David. If you operate from a jealous mindset, you're going to make decisions that further elevate your competition while making yourself look small. Can I tell you, nobody admires jealousy in your life when it comes out. Can I tell you that people recognize it? If you do something out of jealousy, people can see that and and they start to pull away. And jealousy and anger will blind you to God's blessings in your own life. So David's back at the king's court 
Now Saul is filled with rage. Uh, Another demonic spirit torments Saul. And and this time, while David is playing his harp, because you remember a few weeks back, we said David's now the worship leader in the king's court. And when this evil spirit attacks Saul, David comes and plays and he feels peace. Well, now Saul can't feel that peace because the the blessing's coming from David and I'm jealous of David. And so David's playing his harp and Saul tries to kill him by throwing a spear at him twice. This is why Saul is not the commander of the army anymore. You miss the one guy in one room playing the harp and he's not ready for it. (laughs) David continued in, in being blessed by God and having success follow him as he's sent away from the palace. And Saul finally tells David, Remember last week, he, he's supposed to marry the king's daughter. And so Saul says, you can marry the, my daughter for killing Goliath now. But, but he's so jealous of David, he adds a new stipulation. And I, I read this verse to you a while back, but he sends David out to war. He says, you gotta prove yourself first. Even though the thing I told you to do to prove yourself was kill Goliath and you did that, uh, I want you to prove yourself again so that you can marry my daughter. And he does this expecting David to get killed, and and that'll just solve the problem for him. And and so when David returns alive, Saul marries his daughter off to another man, the the prime daughter, the the first daughter who David was supposed to marry. She's married when he finally gets back. So a second daughter is presented as an opportunity for David to marry. So he, he misses out on the first opportunity because someone is creating roadblocks. Something is in the way. And, and so God is still with him. And so he goes back out to do it again. And this time Saul requests a hundred foreskins from the Philistines as the dowry. And I've read this verse to you before. I'm gonna read it again, verse 26. David was delighted to accept the offer. Before the time limit expired, he and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. Then David fulfilled the king's requirement by presenting all their foreskins to him. So Saul gave his daughter to David to be his wife. Now, it doesn't tell us how they were presented. But you have to assume this was not a great room to be in as they were being presented. We also need to stop here for a second because... Again, we're, we're like a couple weeks in now. Um, the Bible is rated M for mature. And, uh, you know, I think it was last week we told you, you know, to picture David with his fingers in the nostrils of Goliath's head as he's carrying it around. And this is now taking place. And Saul's assumption is that, David, you got to go get 100 foreskins for me. That, that if he has to kill 100 people, that out of 100 of them, that one of them is going to kill David. David comes back with 200 and and Saul's plan goes wrong and he goes above and beyond to to take out the Philistines and he throws this sack of foreskins on the, the, you know, Saul's feet or whatever, however you want to picture it, so that he can marry the king's daughter now. And I hope that in your jealous fits of rage that you don't make demands like this. Now, David has remained faithful through all of Saul's attempts to murder him. And God has continued to bless him now with a wife that loves him. Saul's daughter loves David. He's now in the royal family. He's champion of the army. The people start to fall in love with David. They they wanna serve him. They wanna be with him. And when we come to chapter 19, we see the bond of friendship that develops between David and his now brother-in-law, Jonathan. Like, Like things are starting to happen for David and he's toiled in obscurity and he's gone through trials and, and tribulation and now some blessings are starting to roll in his life. And six times we see through chapters 18 to 20, Saul tried to kill David. So it's not just two times with the spear while he's playing the harp. There's six times in these three chapters that that happens. And, and Saul has become consumed with ending David's life. And he's consumed with, with the terror as God has left him, right? And, and so he's just being tormented by demonic spirits. And he's jealous at the obvious activity of God's spirit at work in David's life. I want you to imagine being David. All he ever wanted to do was serve the Lord. He just wanted to be obedient to God, serve faithfully uh, to the Lord and and to honor the king, right? He's been faithful to Saul. He's never done anything wrong to him. He played his harp to drive away the evil and in return, it starts to almost get him killed and and attempts on his life. And I don't know which character you're more like today, but you're probably one of the two. Maybe you're like David. You're trying with all your might to serve God faithfully and you're constantly being bombarded by attacks of the enemy. Spiritual just roadblocks are in front of you and you're like, Lord, I'm, <clears throat> I'm doing the right thing. 
I'm trying my hardest. I, I'm working for you. I, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, and it's just so difficult. Or maybe today you're here and you're like Saul. You're struggling with some anger, some jealousy, because someone appears to have God's blessing and you don't feel like you do. I know that you're probably like one of them. Maybe you're like both at the same time. And this constant running from trials, it wears David down eventually, right? And, and it's draining sometimes to, to honorably and faithfully serve the Lord. And Jonathan, Saul's son, time and time again, he defends Saul to David until finally David is at his breaking point. And in chapter 20, verse 1, it says, David now fled from Naoth in Ramah and found Jonathan. What have I done? He exclaimed, what is my crime? How have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? You can feel in David's cry, like just the, the stress building up and the anxiety building up. And right, it's, it's in there and it probably happens to you as well. And have you ever just got tired from going from one trial to the next you know the, the phrase, out of the frying pan, into the fire, right? And you're like, I, I just escaped this one thing, and now I'm in another. And I've heard it described, not encouragingly, that you're either coming out of a storm in the midst of a storm or heading in to a storm. And our whole life is just this phase of storms that we're going to be in. And you've been there before, you're jumping out of one thing only to find yourself in a worse Situation And David goes from having spears chucked at his head to now being hunted by Saul. And it's one thing to have bad things happen as a result of our mistakes, right? When you sin, the wages of sin are death. There's usually consequences that take place when, when we do wrong things. And, and when you do something wrong, right, that, that's to be expected. But when bad things happen when you're doing right, <clears throat> when you're being faithful to God, it just feels unfair. You know about fairness? Uh, you remember fairness when you were a child, probably, when everything was not fair to you, right? Everyone had it better than you had, no matter what it was. And if you grew up with siblings, everything was unfair because it was always better for everybody but you. I especially know that being the oldest. Oldest children know it's definitely not fair growing up in life, but how boring would this series be if David never faced adversity? And how boring would your life be if you never faced adversity? Whatever your favorite movies are, whatever your favorite TV shows, whatever your favorite books, whatever, whatever kind of fiction things you enjoy, uh, the key Hollywood phrase in, in every script is things get worse. Everything you've ever seen starts off fine or whatever the baseline is. Things get worse and then it's reconciled or it ends poorly and stays worse. But, but that's what intrigues us and that's the story of your life. That's the story of David's life. Things get worse and God shows up and he's faithful. And in, in the absence of suffering, you wouldn't understand joy. If you never had adversity, you wouldn't know what happiness was. And so what are we supposed to do when we're overwhelmed with anger or jealousy or frustration or we let stress and anxiety overtake us and, and it seems like God is nowhere to be heard? I want to submit to you an unconventional approach, maybe even controversial to you today. Uh, I want you to have it out with God. I want you and your anger in your frustration, in your sadness, in your mourning, in your grief, even in your joy, right? To, to bring how you feel about what you feel before the Lord. If you have to yell and scream at God, then yell and scream at God. Saul used God to advance Saul's agenda. He wanted God to help him win battles, and he wanted David around to remove the tormenting spirit. He said, well, this guy is blessed, so let me have him around, and that will help me. But he didn't care about God anymore, and, and so he just wanted to bring victories in battles and to feel better. But Saul wanted to manipulate God for his own betterment. But David, when he was being chased by his enemies, the same ones that God had called him to serve, he let God know what God already knew. And can I encourage you? It's okay. You can bring how you feel to God because he already knows how you feel. Psalm chapter seven, 
David writes uh, during this time. Here's, here's what it says. I'm going to skip through it, but it'll all be up there for you today. I come to you for protection, O Lord my God. Save me from my persecutors. Rescue me. If you don't, they'll maul me like a lion, tearing me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Verse six, arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. Gather the nations before you. Rule over them from on high. The Lord judges the nations. Declare me righteous, O Lord, for I'm innocent, O most high, and the evil of those who are wicked. And defend the righteous, for you look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. Verse 12 If a person does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. He will prepare his deadly weapons and shoot his flaming arrows. Verse 17, I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Does that sound a little bipolar to you? Man, David is going through it. And, and I could just feel the emotion when I read that psalm. And, and, and I can feel that same thing in my own life and, and in your life, right? We have highs and lows. And in just one writing of David, God, I love you. You're so good. God, would you help me? I, I need you involved in my life. God, would you kill my enemies? I'm getting pretty tired of this. And also, uh, God, he's not repentant, and you should probably destroy him for not being repentant. But also, God, I recognize that you are in charge, that you are in control. And God, that I love you. And so David cries out to God. He calls for mercy on himself and justice to be served to his enemies. In Bible college, I learned about these kind of prayers. They're called imprecatory prayers. We pray, Lord, would you get them for me? And he yells at God to wake up. It's interesting, right? Because sometimes I think we've been taught or in church, you got to sanitize yourself when you come to the Lord. Clean up how you feel and be reverent before the Lord. And we should be reverent before the Lord, but I think reverence is honesty of heart as well. And, and so it's okay to come to the Lord and say, God, I'm not happy about this. And you know why it's okay? Because he already knows you're not happy with whatever it is. And so David calls out and, and he has it out with God because he loves God and he knows that God loves him, but he's not happy with the circumstances. And, and so if you had those ugly, nasty moments with a person, with a best friend or a spouse or a family member, right, where, where you can be real and raw, you can cry, you can have snot dripping down your face, and you can go through whatever you're going through, where you're too broken to cover up the pain and the hurt and the struggle. That's what David does, and it's what God wants from you. Your raw, genuine honesty with God is something he already knows and he's waiting for you to come to him and express it. Do you have the kind of relationship with God where you can go before him, open, bare, honest before the Lord? If you could be honest with God, I think you'd find breakthrough. I I think there's healing in that. I think the process of of having it out, and, and I look at it almost like spiritual therapy, Right? You, you need sometimes real therapy. You need to go to a person and you need emotional counseling and, and that's valuable as well. But I also think sometimes our issues that are spiritual are because we won't go to God open and honest. And when we try to hide our jealousy and hurt, this is you, by the way, jealousy and hurt and we, we keep it hidden and we go before the Lord and we bow down before him, right? Like, Lord, I... I love you, I I honor you, and I just, uh, you're so good all the time, and I'm happy about everything that's going on in my life. And when we act like we're happy inside in prayer, right, and we go to the Lord, we're just like Saul trying to manipulate God. Lord, I'm super frustrated. I'm gonna gonna leave that over here on the side, and I'm not gonna worry about it. And then we go to the Lord in prayer. We say, God, You're so good. I love you so much. Uh, If you could just help me with this thing I keep coming back to you for, that'd be wonderful. We try to hide our anger, our jealousy, and we stuff it down. 
We're lying to God. We're lying to ourselves. And, and I want to encourage you to not do that. God wants your honesty. He wants and knows that, that when you've tried to honor him and do good things and it haven't gone your way, he knows that it hurts. David doesn't come to the Lord, and, and we don't have a psalm that says, ah, geez, Lord, it sure is tough to go through life, but I love you no matter what. No, he writes a bunch of psalms, and a bunch of them are David being a little whiny sometimes. A bunch of them are him like pouring out his love and affection and his great feelings towards the Lord. But oftentimes he's also telling God, this is too much. It's not fair. I can't handle it. Will you fix this? And I believe if you go to God in the same way that God will fix it. Can I be real with you guys today? Uh, following God's will is a challenge. It's hard, but following God's will to come back to Sonoma County for our family and to pastor here at Adobe was the easiest spiritual decision I've ever had to make. Uh, it's going to be 60 degrees in July next week. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Like, yeah, Lord, sign me up for, for that. We've had a couple hundred percent votes. So, right, I think we're, we're where we're supposed to be uh, where the Lord has called our family to be. But, but we had a season in ministry where I struggled through a time like David did. And we were on staff in Sacramento, and I led a trip to Fiji. And then I went to Spain to deliver a vehicle to a missionary. And, and I was leading a trip to Swaziland in South Africa. And, and I felt like my time at the church was done. And so I told the pastor, I said, hey, I, I'm going to resign and, uh, and so you got to take kids to Africa. And he said, well, you stay one extra month so that you can take kids to Africa. So, so I stayed an extra month, and, and I'd been doing youth and outreach and missions at the church. We'd been there five years, and I felt like the Lord, like I didn't have direction. I didn't know what was next. The Lord just said, your time is done. And the board there rejected my resignation. We, <laughs> We, we gave it to him on a Sunday morning before, before church. I remember being in the pastor's office, and he called the board members in, and he let them know, and one of them said, no, uh, we, don't, we, we don't accept that. And then they all kind of like, yeah, we don't, we don't accept that. And he had to tell them, like, it's not being offered for your consideration. Like, we're, <laughs> Sean's letting you know that he is leaving. And at the time, we had three babies. I think they were like five, three, and two We'd just gone through an interview process at a church in Napa where we were the only candidates. Uh, and God told the pastor at the very end, like, hey, you need to start over. And when he sat down with me, he, he came out. We sat at a Starbucks. Maybe it's why I still don't drink coffee to this day. <clears throat> and he said, hey, I don't have any reason why we're, we're not moving forward. And we love you guys. But I feel like God is putting a stop on hiring you. And so I'd already put in my resignation, still felt like I was supposed to leave. And so we go into this process of figuring out what's next, and we interview at churches. And three churches told me, you know, you're so amazing, we don't want to hire you because you're too good. This is a paraphrase, but they, they all literally said, like, you shouldn't be a youth pastor anymore, you should be a lead pastor. And, uh, and so I'm like, well, you don't know me. I'm supposed to be a youth pastor. I don't want to be a lead pastor, but thanks so much. And we got great feedback during all that time. And then we went to this huge church, and I got offered this job. Amazing pay, incredible budget, paid youth staff, uh, amazing city. Like, it was everything you would ever want. And finally, I thought, like, okay, this is the reason that I got all the no's along the way. And we got good no's. It wasn't like I didn't get calls back. It wasn't like they're like, uh, thanks, but you were a terrible interview and we never want to see you again. And so we, this opportunity comes at this incredible spot and, and I'm like, okay, Lord, thank you. You know, we went through the process and it's easy to look backwards and see like, okay, all that process was just to get me to where I was supposed to be. And, and then God told me to say no to that job. To that church. Now, I know the Bible. I have done everything that I can possibly do to arrange my life around what God wants me to do and to follow his will. And, and I've followed Jesus everywhere he's ever led me. And I felt like in that time that I deserved the desire of my heart. And this was probably like a top five youth ministry job that, that you could land. And, 
And I was certain, 100% clear from the Lord that God was telling me, do not go there. And, and it had been a full year of searching and, and we were losing our underwater house after the mortgage crisis. And, and right, we thought we bought it at a great deal and it just kept plummeting and, and we couldn't do anything about it. And I couldn't do what David did back then. I couldn't be real and raw with God because I felt like it was my job to accept whatever happened in life and praise the Lord through it. And it is our job to praise God through disappointment and through trials, but God already knew what was in my heart, which was really building a lot of frustration. And not just frustration about the life circumstances, right? Frustration with the Lord. Like, God, I've done everything that you've asked of me, and this is where I want to be. Why aren't you doing it? And God knew what was in my heart and and that I was the one who couldn't do what David did and express it to him honestly. And I was angry at God, and I was also trying to continue being a pastor for this God who was making me really angry, which is really tough to do. You really want a pastor who's emotionally healthy. Uh, (laughs) So you got me at a good time because way back then I had a lot of stuff going on. Verse 17 in that Psalm, David said, I will thank the Lord because he is just. I'll sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. David expressed his disappointment. He got it out. He had it out with God. And then he also praised the Lord through his frustration. That church was shocked when I called to tell them I was passing on the opportunity, and, and then I took another interview, and the pastor said again, hey, you know, uh, man, you'd be a great youth pastor, but I think you should be a senior pastor, and that didn't help my emotions at the time, because I was really frustrated by, by then, and he said, you should be a senior pastor, but hey, would you come preach to our students? Um, and I said, sure, uh, I could use any amount of honorarium now, uh, because as I mentioned, we're losing our house, and needing money. I would preach anywhere for any amount of money. And at the same time, I decided we've done this for almost a a year cycle. And I was making money on the side playing Madden for PlayStation. Don't ask. Um, (laughs) I made more money playing Madden than I made on staff as a youth pastor. But uh, so, so we were okay. And, and so I remember clearly he had us come out and uh, we were running out of money, and I said, Lord, Lord this is going to be it. After I preach here, like, I, I, I can't do this to the family. I, I need to leave professional full-time ministry, and, and I need to go get a different job. And we would had some low points, and this was about as low as I can remember being personally. And, and so we went to this church in Vacaville. Um, pastor's still there, still friends with him today. And Preached to maybe a dozen kids. It was a, a small youth ministry at a mid-sized church. And preached a 25-minute message. And at the end of the night, the pastor, who I would have loved to have worked for, uh, gave me two envelopes. He said, Sean, the first one is the honorarium that we had planned for you. And the second one is what I felt like the Lord told me to give you today. And so Amanda and I get in the car. You know, it's late at night, 9, nine 10 o'clock after the, the service is over. And I don't know which check is which, but we open the first one. And it's $150, which is pretty standard. Uh, and then we open the second check. And this is now, I don't know, 12 years ago. So money was more valuable back then. Um, the second check was for $1,200. And Amanda and I looked at, we just wept in the car. Like it was enough to go one more month which led to us planting the church that we planted and making the move to being a lead pastor that people told me all year long. I just couldn't hear it from them. I was not in a state where strangers who were not hiring me could tell me what they thought I should do. But it's a funny thing about the Lord is he gives you a lot of signs along the way. And if you can notice them early on, you might avoid some of the problems that are going on. And And then we continued to be in ministry, and and I was at the very end. Rebecca, if you want to come up, I was ready to quit, thinking God had moved on. It wasn't that my heart was, it was like, Lord, every door is being closed, and so obviously the Lord must not want this for us anymore. And so when I was finally real, I said, Lord, I'm I'm quitting. I'm going to have to do something different. Galatians 6, 9 says this, let's not get tired of doing what's good. 
at just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. I wish that I had the ability through that time to be okay with being angry at God, being real with God. Looking back now, I can recognize the tension that was going on in my heart was just a life transition that was taking place, that spiritually God was doing something to take me from one thing that I was doing that I was supposed to be doing to the next thing that he wanted me to be doing. And and, and so I was obedient through it, but I didn't know what the Lord was doing and I wasn't going to Lord, Lord, I'm so frustrated. And maybe if I had just listened to the four different pastors, spiritual, mature people, hey, you know, what we see in your life is maybe uh, something different. No, you don't know me. Pride, arrogance, lack of humility will prevent us from walking in what God has. And that I think pride and arrogance keeps us from going before the Lord with how we really feel. I told God at the end, like, God, I, I love you. Your process is frustrating. And I remember during it, going to God, not like, Lord, what do you, what should I consider about what these spiritually wise people are telling me? I, God, stop having these pastors who don't know me tell me what to do. I know who I am. And I felt like I had to come to God perfect. And even though I knew I was hurting and struggling, like I'm a pastor, so Lord, would you, you know, be holy and do all these things and whatever. I do know someone, I won't say their name because this is going to be on the internet and they might see it. (laughs) That when they pray, they pray in King James English, which is strange because they don't speak in King James English. But I think it's a really good metaphor for sometimes how we think we have to come to the Lord. You don't have to the, thus, the Lord in your prayer. He's cool with however you talk to yourself, to your neighbor, to your coworker. You can just talk that way. Boldly, we can come before the Lord, but also that boldness means to be raw and and to to be able to be free to show the Lord how you're really feeling. I think those kinds of prayers are probably more effective for you anyway. And David had this down. David still goes through trials. We still got many more chapters as we go through this summer series of David having problems. It doesn't solve the problems. David's just cool with it. It's like, Lord, I'm super frustrated. I come to you, and the Lord does something, and he moves him on. And then it happens again and again And again, and it took me finally saying to God, Lord, thank you for all that I got to do. I genuinely was was happy. It was a blessing to have gotten to serve in ministry as a pastor. But Lord, if you're closing these doors, I I accept it and I'll keep serving you. And I'm gonna get my family in a great church and and we love you, but, but now that this life change is happening and it took getting there and being real with God before breakthrough came before spiritual health came. Here's what I didn't know. The pastor in Napa gave us money when we planted the church and then mentored me every single week for the first two or three years. The one who didn't hire me. The one in Vacaville gave us like $500 a month for our salary to help support us when we planted the church. Multiple people along the way invested in us after we were where we were supposed to be. The ones who I was like, you don't know anything, you don't know me. God put them in my life, we developed relationships. It was true, they actually did like me. It wasn't just a, we don't wanna hire you, but you're so amazing, right? No, we developed friendships and, and I gained mentors out of it. And, and then I had help when I got into the place that God wanted me to be in. But I had to get there with the Lord before spiritual health came. And, And so some of you need to have it out with God. I know I did. You've been living in competition with others. Maybe you've held on to jealousy and hurt. Maybe you've been doing it right and you're just frustrated because it's been so difficult and you smiled through all the prayers to the Lord and you praised him like you're supposed to do. Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Jesus the Son of God, God in the flesh, never sinned once, 
<clears throat> getting ready to go to the cross, and he says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus does it right. But he even says, Lord, this burden is too great. Would you take this cup from me? With the hardest thing ever in the history of mankind, he was honest with God. What a great model for you and I, that no matter what we're facing, we can bring our feelings, our emotions to the Lord. David praised the Lord after he let it out. And so that's what I'm gonna give us the opportunity to do today. If the worship team can come, I want you to have an opportunity as we do one final song to get to release whatever it is you're feeling, whatever has been going on between you and the Lord. Prayerfully, respectfully, don't go wild. But this song is gonna play, and maybe you'll sing the words to the song, and that's fine. But maybe this would be a really good opportunity for you to bear your soul to the Lord, to just quietly whisper, God, this is how I really feel. Because if you've never done that, then you are this shaken can. And you know what usually happens in your life? When you bury all that stuff down, when you force it down and you, you think like it's not there, first it makes you sick, okay? Then it either comes out against your will and it just explodes all over But you know what happens if you never open it up and you never let it out? Eventually, if this just sits and months pass, it's going to go flat. And here's what's more concerning to me. Not that if you have outbursts of anger, right? Those, I think the Lord can deal with. That's you expressing, hopefully not in, in unhealthy ways, but right? You let that out, that's good. When it never comes out, this will eventually go flat. It will lose its potency. It will lose the purpose that it was created. It will lose the thing that was put into it that energized it, right? It's just regular water until they carbonate it. And until we have the spirit, right, we're, we're just regular. And then God, we come, we give our life to him. He fills us with the Holy Spirit and puts something in us that energizes our soul. And if we don't let it out, we become flat. The Bible calls it lukewarm. And we lose our effectiveness for the kingdom. We lose our effectiveness for loving others like Jesus loved others. And, and so more than I want an explosion, I, I want you to be able to do this. You come to the Lord, no matter what's been going on, say, Lord, would you help me? Right? And, and you know, you can diffuse some things if you go to the Lord and you just pray a prayer. And then when you, in a healthy way, slowly release it. It's just fine. And the Lord is capable of handling whatever slow release you have going on in life. Sometimes it bubbles over. <laughs> Animals and carbonated drinks. There's no way to know what they're going to do. <clears throat> I don't know where you're at, but I'm going to ask you to stand today. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to give you an opportunity for a slow release, a slow, honest of the heart. God, here's where I am. Would you help me? I love you. I need you. But God, this is where I'm really at today. God, I thank you for every person in here. And Lord, we're all struggling with something. Whether it's doing your will and attacks are coming, whether it's the other end of the spectrum and God, we're, we're just living in sin. We've sort of forgotten about you. Today is our day, Lord, to return back to you. And, and for those in the middle, God, who are, who are trying their hardest, we're doing what we know to do, God, maybe today for some of us, this is a real challenge to be authentic with you, to come before you unsanitized, 
And Lord, the, the amazing thing is when it comes to sin, Lord, we, we know inherent, we know we can come before you, God, and you'll forgive us of any sin. And when we call on the name of the Lord, we'll be saved. And, and God, if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us of that sin. God, we're not only talking about sin, though. <clears throat> For some of us, God, we, we're trying, we love you, and we're just struggling with frustration, struggling with jealousy, struggling, God, with feeling like you're not being fair, whatever fair even is. And so, God, I just pray today that in these next few minutes, as we come before you and we worship, because, God, worship is the key to all things, because you're worthy no matter what's going on. You're worthy no matter how we feel. And so, God, I pray that we take these next few minutes of worship, and we would worship in song, but we'd also worship by being honest with you. God, we worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus, you are the foundation of all truth. And so we can come before you and be honest and truthful with how we're feeling and what we're going through and the frustration we might have and the anger we might have. And God, why aren't you doing this thing that we've been asking you to do? And why haven't you come through? And why are we confused? And why do we feel lost? And God, where are you? God, would you make yourself known to your people as we worship you now these next few minutes in Jesus' name.